and that's when you found her? Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but because of her age, we're like, uh, what does this mean? Man, that thing is wow. swollen. It's all heck too in there. You have to intervene. You can't expect the animal to be able to naturally hibernate and survive being compromised. And well, here we are, intervening. Thanksgiving is right around the corner, which means the coldest portions of the year are inevitably upon us. And if you're a reptile keeper like we are, I'm sure you're thrilled about that. Well, if you keep reptiles outdoors 24 seven, like we do with a lot of our turtles and tortoises, you have to get prepared, which means you gotta throw on the jacket and you gotta come out here to modify things. Today, we're gonna be barricading our tortoises into their little cold frames. And I know that sounds like a harsh term, but I'm gonna show you why I'm doing it. I got a nice big bale of straw here, and this is gonna be a nice insulation layer for the tortoises that are going to be hibernating, or the reptile version of hibernation, which is brumating inside these cold frames. Now, the reason I'm gonna barricade some of these tortoises into them is because of their geographical locations in nature, and it's really important for you to know that. So, for instance, right now we are in our Western Herman's tortoise pens, and each different pen holds a different locality of them. That means these animals come from a specific area in nature, and they may experience experience different types of seasons or fluctuations. So depending on where they come from in nature will determine what kind of fluctuation they go through during the four parts of the year. They do experience summer, fall, winter, and spring to some degree, but some experience a harsher winter while others experience a very mild one. So we're gonna start with our Western Hermans group from Mallorca, Spain. Now Mallorca is one of the Balearic Islands, a beautiful island with sand and low-lying shrubbery. A shrubbery! and it's kind of a milder area. So what that means is there's not too much when it comes to extremes. Here in New Jersey, our summers can get up to an over 100 degrees with insane humidity, and our winters can get down into the teens. Here in the coastal southern portion of New Jersey, it's a lot milder, so we don't have as much to worry about down here as they do up north, but we still have to prepare these animals. Now they do know how to brumate. They know how to respond to the seasons. They know exactly what to do because you can't get rid of instinct, and these are all Hermans tortoises. So what that means is these environmental factors will trigger certain behaviors in the animals. It's fall. The leaves are dying off, things are turning brown, it's getting colder by the day, the nights are approaching freezing, so the animals naturally know to start digging down to protect themselves. They don't sit out unless there's something wrong with them. So what we're gonna do is round them up. I can see there's a couple in here already, and we're gonna give them a nice thick bed of straw for that insulation layer that'll benefit them, especially on the really cold nights that we might get. And I'm also going to close off the entrance to this so the animals are in a nice controlled environment. These polycarbonate panels that we've shown you guys in a lot of different videos when it comes to these cold frames are really helpful for the animals because it always keeps it just a little bit warmer in here. Nothing ever freezes solid no matter how cold it gets. And the animals, because again, this is brumation, not a true hibernation, can come up and bask on the days that they want to and then go back down for when it gets cold because reptiles are in a torpor of sorts. They're not completely down for the count like some animals are. Most of the Mallorcan tortoises are in here already. You can see them down here, beautiful black and gold. And I'm not gonna disturb them. I've been keeping an eye on them. I know how they're doing. And now that they're on their descent underground, I don't wanna disturb them in any way. However, if something happens during the course of hibernation or brumation, I can come out here, easily open this up and check on things. Like if we get some kind of crazy warm up or if it gets that cold, it's so easy to know where they are. And Western Herman's tortoises can be a little bit more sensitive in situations like this than say your Eastern Herman's tortoise. And again, it does come down to locality. We're dealing with Mallorca, which is a milder area. So I like to go the extra mile for these guys. Um, still, have somebody that's not in here, so we're gonna look for her. But in the meantime, I'm gonna add some straw here because we have this open. So next what I'm gonna do is actually barricade them inside this. And the reason I wanna do that is because again, with brumation, these animals will sometimes become active. I don't want them to start exploring on an extra warm day because that does happen here in South Jersey and go out to the pen somewhere 
get stuck in an area that's not ideal for them and then accidentally freeze overnight. You know, maybe we're traveling when that happens or, you know, anything can happen. Always err on the side of caution. So all I'm gonna use is a simple Pennsylvania field stone to block the entrance of this from the inside. And there's no way the tortoises can push that because I'm gonna really wedge it in there. I used to actually use a piece of wood and screw it in there, but I found that to be unnecessary. This is who I was looking for. The last tortoise that's gotta go in there. And uh, she picked a spot over here near the cold frame to dig down. But what was interesting is what she did, last night she spent completely underground because it was in the upper 30s and she's all caked with dirt here. But just now she had been surfacing because this is the warmest portion of the day. Remember, these animals slowly descend underground. They don't just go ahead and rapidly bury themselves and then that, that's it, see ya. They will play that game with going up and down for a while until they feel the need to stay put unless warmth comes back. So that's exactly what this animal was doing. And this also gives us a great chance to health check her. And she looks awesome. She's got a good weight. She's thick. Her eyes are nice and beady and black and clear. And uh, she's ready to join the rest of the group. So uh, happy sleeping. I'm gonna place her just underneath this nice thick layer of straw, but I'm gonna let her actually dig into the soil and sand when she's ready to. Pick a spot right here where there's nobody else. Go lady. And we'll cover her back up. So now I simply close this lid and latch it. I've got cameras on this area 24 seven. And uh, well, they're good to go. It's time to move on to the next pen. This Western Hermit's tortoise right here is being a little bit more active because she descends from Vaoise, France, or Var for short. That's in the southern portion of France. So this is again a Western Hermit's tortoise just like those Mallorcans I just showed you, but we're treating them a little bit different. And the reason is because the Mallorcans will most likely get woken up a little bit earlier than these guys will. These guys will naturally wake up in the spring when everybody else does here. Whereas because the Mallorcans will typically experience only a two and a half to three month long brumation, we may need to wake them up sooner and bring them in so they can resume natural activity and also breed the way they're supposed to. Remember, these are Western Europe's, one of Western Europe's most endangered reptiles. So it's very important here. And it's very important to know the locality. If that's information that you can get, then you can really hone in on how to specifically treat your animals. And in fact, their whole group, because they are less triggered by the cold, is still out in the open here in the pen. They're going underground at night, coming up during the day, but none of them have made their way back to the greenhouse. So I'm gonna help them to do that now, because again, Thanksgiving's coming, which means it's going to get pretty darn cold. So there is actually one var tortoise that did dig down, and the reason I know she's here is by the disturbance. You can see that something dug into the ground and pushed the dirt up around it, or on top of it. So that's an easy way to locate the tortoises if you're going through this right now or at any time soon, and you need to find them. Those are those disturbance areas you wanna look for because at this portion of the year, at least here in Southern New Jersey, the tortoises haven't completely disappeared yet where rain and leaves have fallen over their burrows and you have no idea where they are. So that's a good way to find them. I know one's right here. Something worth bringing up is how these animals really respond to fluctuations. So let's say these tortoises are buried underground, winter is well in effect now, it's cold and it's dreary and miserable. The animals will stay put, but if the temperature starts to fall, subconsciously the animals know to dig deeper and they will use that as a trigger to start digging deeper. If it warms, they subconsciously start making their way to the surface until it gets so warm that they are getting close to resuming normal, optimal body temperature and then they become fully active. They start basking and if it keeps staying like that, they develop their appetites again and of course they get into breeding for the season. So uh, really, really cool that they do that.
Here out at the aquascape pond, things are a little bit different because these turtles spend the winter under the water, even if ice forms. Now, there's a lot of powerful pumps that keep this ecosystem going at all times, even throughout the winter, so they are never in danger of anything freezing solid. Not to mention, it just doesn't get that cold here in South Jersey for that to really happen. But even when there's a thin layer of ice, the animals stay underneath the ice and they are perfectly safe. They are absorbing oxygen through their butts. It's true, it really is a thing. Through their cloacas, they are taking in oxygen. And again, because they are in brumation, they can become active on warmer days, come up to the surface for a breath of air, and then go back down. So in here, the Blanding's turtles, the spotted turtles, the North American wood turtles, an array of other rescued turtles that are all aquatic species, sleep in the safety of the bottom of this aquascape ecosystem until spring and because of their low energetic needs, well, they don't need anything else. In here, things couldn't get any more natural. This is a natural area of the woods here that we fenced in for our eastern box turtles. Again, not Otis. We've showed you guys this pen many times. And all the eastern box turtles in here are gone. They have found little nooks and areas that they feel safest in this deep pine and leaf litter and they've disappeared and we most likely will not see them till mid-April because eastern box turtles for whatever reason tend to wake up a lot later than some of our other native species like diamondback terrapins and spotted turtles. There's a few of them right here. That one right here. Another one there. And here's one right here. This is the time of year where the Eastern box turtle really gets to shine when it comes to that natural coloration, the oranges, yellows, and reds, and browns that are normally associated with the species. When you get all this falling on the forest floor, the box turtles really can start to disappear. So I thought they were actually a little bit deeper already, but they're actually right at the surface and only starting to bury themselves. But because of their coloration in the leaf litter, you just can't really see them. Super cool. Let's see what else is going on. A lot of disturbance in this little area right here, which means there's probably several turtles in this immediate area. A lot of times when turtles go to brewmate, they actually cluster and they will do that underwater too. So I'm sure somebody's right here. Yep, there we go. So we've got our Chinese box turtles in this pen and here's one right here. She's gone down several inches already. Cover her back up. Let's see if anybody else is over here. Here's another one. See its shell right there. So this is a favorite area by the Chinese box turtles. It's good to know that I know where several of them are now. And you know, even though they come from China and other areas, just like the Eastern box turtles and the, and the Herman's tortoises, they know what to do. It's getting cold, they're digging down where they can stay safe. So a big portion of the collection is asleep or has already come inside as we've shown you guys in the last few videos. We brought in all of our big exotic tortoises that come from areas like Madagascar, South America, other parts of Africa. They're inside now. Uh, and just last week's video, you saw when we had Mark Double D over from the TSA, we rounded up our Mexican box turtles. So what's still out here though, are some other tortoises. Now I know I showed you how I barricade our Western Hermans tortoises to their cold frames. I don't do that for the Easterns. Right there, out in the open here in the pen is a big female Eastern Hermans tortoise. So why don't I go the extra length for them? They're a little bit hardier, a little bit more tolerant of certain areas. And this particular group comes from Macedonia in Greece and it gets 
got really cold there. So there's really nothing I need to do from them. Their pen is in an upland area uh, with a high content of sand to it naturally here in South Jersey. So these tortoises have never needed any intervention from me. And that also goes for marginated tortoises and our Ibra Greek tortoises. Those animals get to pick where they want to go. Anywhere in their pen is safe because it's out of flooding, it's still in the sun, and they can go as deep as they need to or they can surface whenever they want to. We've never lost any. And you know, to be honest, maybe I don't need to be doing what I'm doing for the Western Hermans, but because they're such a tiny animal and because they come from really interesting specific parts of the world, I just like to make sure that they're nice and rounded up. So I still can keep an eye on my Easterns. I have a general idea of where they are. And as long as they're exhibiting this behavior this time of year, I know that they are safe. Sometimes there's an animal that unfortunately comes down with something and when it's this close to the inactive period you have to intervene. You can't expect the animal to be able to naturally hibernate and survive being compromised and well here we are intervening. All right, so here is one of two animals that are presenting a problem for us this fall. This is a male Western Hermit's tortoise. He belongs to one of our Italian localities, and he's a very vital part of that breeding group. If something were to happen to him, it would really kind of shoot the group in the arm for a while. Uh, so it's important that we intervene here. But just so you guys know, every single animal's life here is important. It just really would have meant um, devastation for the breeding group. So here he is. And the reason that we brought him in was because he was really emaciated. I noticed he was starting to get light and then almost very rapidly he got really light. His eyes were sunken in, he was losing those head muscles again, and he really alarmed me. So we brought him in to Dr. Chris Lambert, who you guys have seen on many of our videos, and we took a look at his x-rays, we took a look at his blood. His blood count was a little bit off, but overall the tortoise wasn't presenting any kind of insane uh, issue that was like really apparent. So what we decided to do was put him on a mild antibiotic for a potential infection somewhere. And we also have been giving him fluids. And let me tell you, he has really started to bounce back. He's not done with treatment yet. We're gonna give him his antibiotic right now, but he really is, I mean, he's heavy, he's eating like a pig, and he's really kind of focusing on uh, eating, basking, and doing all normal tortoise behaviors. But even though he's improving, He's got to skip hibernation this year. We can't go throw him back into the fire like that because we have no idea how he re would respond. But that's okay, he'll be all right. It's not long term, it's just one season. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and give him his antibiotic first. Now, I'm not gonna talk about the drug being used and I'm not even gonna talk about the dosage being used because we are not veterinarians. So we're not gonna be responsible for anything that may be taken from this video uh, and applied to someone else's animals. This is all advised by our veterinarian and uh, you know the proper dosage and course of action has been well assessed. So not something we're gonna share with everybody. We just wanna show you what goes into a problematic animal during this time of year or really any time of year. First things you do, you're gonna clean the area with alcohol, right there. And since this is an intramuscular injection, we're gonna go right here under the scale, very lightly into that muscle. Pull back, make sure there's no blood, and in you go. Put a finger there, make sure nothing comes out. Sometimes a little bit does come out. Again, a nice quick rub with alcohol, and he's done. Now he needs fluids. All right, fluids. Now I know this needle seems huge and the amount in it seems huge, but this is prescribed by our veterinarian. It is the right dosage and what this animal needs to get. And it is one of the reasons why he is improving so amazingly. So fair warning right now, if you don't like needles and you don't like what's happening right here, then look away or maybe fast forward. We're gonna clean the area and just give him his fluids, which is what's really been helping to save this animal. All right, Luigi, you're all done. His name is Luigi. He was named by our veterinarian's practice. So uh, there you go, bud. He's gonna continue to spend the winter indoors, and I think he's gonna be in great shape by the spring. He he's really, really a breath of fresh air right now, doing great. The next animal we have, we're gonna take to the veterinarian right now, and you guys are gonna come with us because we are pretty nervous about her.
This beautiful old gal is Athena. She is the largest known example of the Eastern Hermit's tortoise in the United States. She measures 11.2 inches. So a lot of times people hear, oh, Hermit's tortoises only grow to seven or eight inches. Well, they absolutely can get bigger. And let me tell you, she's the largest here. But over in Europe, where these guys come from, there are even larger examples. We have no idea how old Athena is. She is ancient. She was found walking down the street in California almost 50 years ago now, I believe. We've had her, I think, about six years, and you can really see how old she is just by looking at her carapace. You can see that over time it's eroded and it's pitted, which is normal as these animals really age. But um, this tortoise that I'm holding here right now could very well be over 100 at this point because of just how eroded the shell is. But remarkably, she is still reproductive. These animals don't slow down the way mammals do. They can, can still be reproductive even in their elder years. And in fact, the older moms tend to be the better moms because they know the more suitable nesting areas to put the eggs. But enough about that. Here's the problem. Right there. Athena has some pretty gnarly swelling going on in this area where the skin meets the plastron. It's also, I'm not gonna hurt her, but it's also been a little bit bloody and foul smelling. So this could be some kind of abscess uh, or some kind of infection. Our hope is that she's not going septic and our hope is that it's not something like a sign of an organ starting to fail and that's why we're seeing this swelling becoming apparent. She is very old. All animals have a time coming, but um, you know, we hope it's not hers yet. So we just found her like this as we were doing our rounds out there and we have an appointment to get her into Dr. Lambert right now. So let's get in there and let's hope for um, something, some kind of news. All right, girl. She was outside with Garen just doing hibernation checks, and that's when you found her. Like, yeah. Okay. So she's, you know, always outside year year round, twenty four seven for. I mean, at least five years, maybe six years now. And she wasn't she wasn't going down. Yeah. She was she was you know on the surface just kind of walking around, and she looks great until you get there. Yeah. yeah. See. Oh, yeah. And it smells foul. The and, question is, uh, what is it there? Let's see. I don't know. She's really, really strong. Weird. All right. Ready? Yeah. Time to go. Four point one eight kegs. So that's like almost ten pounds. <laughs> that's a big size. <laughs> ten pound Herman's tortoise. Let's <laughs> see. Hey you. What's going on? Yeah, she's really I mean, strong. Yeah, she's ancient. See I this? mean, yeah. Look at that. <laughs> when we got her, she was all this gold color, and then just over time, that's eroded down to like the, you know, I guess left layer of keratin. Oh, God. Hey, you. I mean, up front, head looks good. I mean, so moving those arms really good. Yeah. Is she ambulatory in that back? Well, you see her move, like, will she walk across in that leg, too? Yeah, I've seen her. Yeah, she seems to. Yeah, I mean, she's I know still she's moving it. Mm. Yeah, she is. Yeah, but because of her age, we're like, uh, what does this mean, you know? Well, that's the concern. It's just like, I've never, I mean, I'm going to take a closer look back there right now, but no belly effusion in there. It feels good inside there. Man, it really is. Hey, there, you're, you're doing good. Man, that stinks. Man, it is wow. swollen as all heck, too, in there. The question is, like, it's all inflamed here. I mean, I know, girly. So... Herman's tortoise have the nail at the end of the tail. And in males, it's insanely exaggerated. Fall is a peak breeding. Could I wonder if a nail did that. Yeah. Ideally, what we should do is try to like poke it to see if we get like white blood cells back there. And I mean, potentially culture. I mean, we're on antibiotics right now, so I don't know how good the culture would be right now because like if we were had antibiotics, it could like not, it could like make the culture negative even though it wouldn't be. So I don't know if I would do that. I, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely try to try to sample it though. If you guys are cool with that, I'm basically gonna try to put a needle into it and just then look on the microscope and see what kind of things mm -hmm. we got going on there. Okay. Um, I mean, I do, you know, we could do blood arc being too strong. She's not showing any signs of that. I mean, this looks to be full, pretty full. I wonder if we can try to sample it, see what we got, and then go from there. Like, okay. I, I wonder if Septazamine I mean, gets in the bottle. We just, got, she's a big girl. I mean, she's yeah, got a bigger dose she's than the other one, but dose, yeah. Um, yeah, 22, three cc, that'd be good. Eating? Oh yeah. yeah, and I mean she's not supposed to be now. She's supposed to be going into hibernation, 
but, her but, mom something. but she was staying above. But you know what's interesting about her? She wasn't, she wasn't uh, trying to bed down or start to burrow in. Yeah. She was on the surface, but she wasn't even being lethargic about it. She was actually foraging. But uh, no, and then he just snapped out of it, and he's eating fine. And the question is, what's what's underneath here, right? That's the. I got some bloody fluids. I mean, fluid is fluid, so we should be able to look on the microscope and see like what's in there. Is there bacteria? Is it just inflammation? Is there weird cells in there that make us concerned with something else going on? So, is yeah. uh. Will you be able to tell if she's septic by looking at that? No. Do we see a ton of like heterophils in this one area that makes us think this is infection or inflammation there? Okay. That makes us say, hey, you know what? This could be like an infection or abscess that we need to treat her with anti antibiotics there. That's what that um, will tell us. That's what that will tell us there. Or is there, you know, is there a growth? It just, it's not like a solid mass. It's just soft and a little bit firm in some places, but yeah. more just swollen tissue. So. Yeah. There, she wants to go hang out back in there, and we got pretty much everything good there. Let's uh, we'll let this air dry, give you know, like 10 minutes, and we'll go from there. Okay. Not a ton of white blood cells, which is kind of bummer. It's a lot of red blood cells. I mean, okay. In theory, it could have missed the abscess, right? I mean, it smells like that. I mean, there could just be a lot of swelling around it, and okay. that's why it didn't show up. I mean, this is what I'm seeing is basically just a lot of red blood cells in there. I mean, there's just red blood cells everywhere, which you could see when I poked it, it was bloody there. Yeah. It, you know, sometimes these abscesses can be thick in them, and so, like, sometimes it could be stuck deeper inside of there. I just didn't get close enough to the sample there. Okay. Um, I mean, at this point, I, I think, you know, could we continue our antibiotic therapy? Potentially, but then if this isn't improving, you know, within I think a week or two, then we gotta consider like surgery to like open it up. There. I mean, to go explore. I just don't know where this is coming from there, right? Is it okay. deeper or is it in just that leg there? I mean, it's tough. I mean, this yeah. is one that like, I don't think like an x-ray is gonna show as much at this point. I mean, okay. All right, well, there you go. A um, lot of red blood cells, no white, right? None? None, none, yeah. <laughs> So uh, we're not sure. There could be an abscess that they just couldn't get to in there. Um, we're gonna put her on a course of antibiotics for a while uh, and anti-inflammatory. Anti yep. And then we'll see what happens. If it doesn't respond to that, then I think we gotta sedate her and actually go in there and see what's happening. Yep. So stay tuned. Fingers crossed for Athena.